Episode 8. All right. We're doing something this episode called Ream Room, where we take somebody's art who submitted it, um, and I did a paint over of their art for them. If that sounds like something that you might be interested in, then uh, at the end of this video, at about the 20 minute mark, I'll uh, talk a little more about what's involved in that process, uh, how we would do it, and uh, some of the details involved in how to critique it. So looking at this thing, what I think we could change to make it look awesome. Um, and you can see the top one is the photo. The bottom one, um, he did a pretty solid job of getting all the colors in there. Um, and uh, I'm, this is a screen capture that's recorded and played faster, so I'm going to look at what's happening and try to catch up and explain to you, because the original one was about an hour long, and I didn't want to have a full hour video. So I thought, I'll just look at what I'm doing and then remember what I was explaining to him at the time and then retell you. So there, that was an important little thing. I did that little swoop on the right end of the mountain to kind of give you to kind of simplify it. The first thing was there's just too many little fussy bits sticking out. And I know the thing has fussy bits, but I wanted to just get rid of those and simplify it and make it something that was um, more dynamic. And that's the thing with, uh, with painting. I think you have to take whatever shapes are there, understand the essence of them, which we talked about quite a bit, and then simplify them. And you can already see how just getting rid of some of those fuzzy, hairy edges um, makes it a lot more believable. Then the next thing right after that is you can do what I'm doing now, which is starting to add those little bumps that say what it is. Because too much stylization and it no longer feels like that mountain. Because you'll notice like at the top of that mountain in the photo, uh, you'll see all those little bridges are kind of part of that structure and they're kind of important. Like we can't cut them out altogether. So we need to indicate them in some way. I just uh, want to start off by making a strong dynamic shape. Um, now I'm taking Marlowe and uh, just kind of, what am I doing? Mm, oh, see, I just realized that I selected him properly. Getting rid of that extra swag. Now what? Oh, okay. Cool. I'm probably explaining something super important right now. Oh, here I go. Yeah. So this is, again, like we did a lot of times before, is like trying to understand the essence of what's there. I'm noticing that the way this rock erodes, um, the geology of the rock. Now, I'm, I get really excited about the geology of rock because I feel like one of the coolest things in concepts is to have dramatic nature. So I like to see and understand that in this case, there's all these flutes going down this mountain, and that the way the water erodes, it makes these kind of V-shaped things. And until you go in there with the red and try to study it, you don't really understand exactly what's happening. Um, now I'm kind of just softening the entire thing. I made another clipping mask, as you can see, on top of the, on top of the base layer of purple. And I'm just worrying about one thing. That is the shape of the highlight. And you saw I did that before, but... Uh, um, something that uh, Jacob said when he was when he gave me this thing, when we were talking about what he, you know, how he uh, improved, and he was saying that he was making a lot of chicken scratch marks and hoping that it would come into a sexy looking painting. And what he realized is from watching the videos is that, you know, sexy looking paintings don't just happen; they're not just magically happen. Every stroke is thoughtfully and carefully planned. That's how all masterful sexy painters like. Uh, like Sargent used to do stuff. So Marlowe's really good, because I don't know if you guys mess around with Marlowe, but like you make a stroke one way, and it, uh, it, it, it is kind of lighter on one end than it is the other. It depends on which way you make the mark. So when you mess around with Marlowe, you'll notice if you go left to right, the soft end is on one side. If you go right to left, the soft end is on the other side. So I'm always conscious of which way I'm making the mark in order to show in order to keep one edge soft and one edge hard. Because you can look at that mountain up there and you'll notice like one edge is where the light is hitting and the other edge is kind of a little bit softer. And right now, I'm trying to make, again, samurai style marks. Just whoosing! every single mark is like thought out and placed carefully, slowly. I can, I'm erasing back out of it a little bit. And notice, if you notice on the right there, look at the little uh, the layers. All of this is done on one separate layer. And I'm not worrying too much about the details right now in terms of like the exact shapes of it. I'm kind of just like trying to get one side of the shapes. You'll notice like in the middle, some of those marks of Marlowe are a little bit clunky, but I'm just trying to get the general vibe of where those shapes are in a quick, dynamic, zingy sort of way. And then I'll go back later and kind of tighten them up a little bit, finesse them a little bit. 
Um, and notice here in the shadows, they're a little bit lighter and softer. So I'm taking uh, that big Tyrion Lannister because it has a slight bit of texture on it and making one mark to soften those and make it look like the texture of trees. You know, it's like a little Tyrion Lannister, and only because Tyrion Lannister has a tiny bit of texture on him does a light stroke with it better than using, let's say, Joffrey. Because Tyrion has the texture in him, and because there's a tree texture, of course, on all those on all that mountain, because it's all covered in trees, it's nice to kind of get in there and just uh, make one erase stroke and have that be descriptive of trees. You know what I mean? Instead of going in there and noodling in a bunch of damn trees. Um, so now I'm going in and just kind of... Uh, maybe making it a little more real. See, I turned it off. You can see how fuzzy and hairy and zingy, like it chin shitty it was before. And now I'm just trying to make it solid and crisp. Um, you never want to express an edge in a fuzzy way, ever. Especially if it is a hard edge. That's not the area where you express yourself. On any hard edge, you express it ext in an extremely crisp and hard way. And then you let... Maybe a little bit of edge blending happen later in areas where there's shadow and areas where you want to push it away. You have a reason for making a soft edge. I like to err on the side of making everything crisp and pretty strong, if it is crisp and strong, and then going in later and softening things up. Always easier than softening things up, uh, making painting things mushy and building crispness out of it. And that's the thing. That was the way painting happened when you learned traditionally a lot more, is where you would kind of start a little bit uh, loose and you'd build Christmas out of it. That's just not uh, a fruitful way to work digitally, I think. Um, so now I added some oranges in the highlights, a little bit of color shift, you know, like to just make, you see the highlight, the light side is a little bit lighter, but then I added a tiny bit more orange. Those subtle color shift will really do a lot. And you'll notice now I'm adding some little bit richer blues in the shadows again it's on a separate layer i assume right yeah there it goes separate layer and i'm adding like just those just soft uh rich subtle blues which it's amazing how just one level of extra slightly darker slightly more saturated color will add just like richness to the forms you see how like all the forms are kind of starting to pop out a little bit more just from that blue layer and it's on its own layer I don't know if I make it actually a little bit lighter and bluer because it's a little bit too dark right now I wonder if I actually end up changing that I don't remember um, but just even if it even if I wanted it a little lighter because it's on its own layer I can always just go in and lighten it up a little bit you know adding some of the darkness there that kind of uh, or softening now some of the edges um, getting in there and trying to carve out those shapes now a little bit more. Now get everything's on a separate layer, so it's this is a great way to just keep on erasing. I'm surprised I'm not using a layer mask. You could use a layer mask for this. Um, what am I doing? Okay, yeah, and then adding a little bit of Cal Drogo where the shadow and light meet, because where the shadow and light meet is where you're going to see the texture, where you're going to see the most texture. I don't know if you guys know that, but that's a you know classic art thing. Is where the form turns is where you see the texture. So I'm taking Cal Drogo and I added it up there on that top right mountain. Just a little bit of a race of Cal Drogo, just because that's kind of where you would see the texture a little bit more. Um, what's going on now, Zs? Okay, looking at the bottom area, I use some different techniques for this um, that I would not use for the mountains. And that's the interesting thing about Photoshop is you really want to well, you want to use whatever technique is the right technique for that job. Get it as, and not worry about it being Photoshoppy. You know what I mean? So if you if you feel like there's a tool, in this case it will be the line tool, that will express uh, something the most effectively, then I use that and I don't worry about it being Photoshoppy. I let Photoshop be Photoshop and then later I unify it or I try to unify it a little bit. Now this is a tough image because of that exact reason is that I'm going to be using two very different types of brushes and two very different types of techniques. But you'll notice there I added like a gradient of the background first, the base layer first, and forgot about all the lights. And then I started going in with the line tool and what would be the most efficient way to draw perspective of a freeway? Well, the line tool. So why not? Get that color in there. Just throw it in there to start. Get it going. And then later you can go in and like add a stroke on top of it. You, you've noticed that like probably in the last videos and you'll see in this one, it's just a tiny little bit of tick marks. You could erase out of that light, light area just a tiny bit with a slight bit of stroke. Take a Freeman to the edge of it just ever so briefly. And all of a sudden... It won't look it won't look artificial anymore. 
all of a sudden it won't look very mechanical anymore. But yeah, the line tool, especially for perspective-y things, and something I, I didn't go into when I was doing this and I didn't explain is that I kind of, the reason I chose the line tool is because I decided that was the essence of these shapes. And we've talked about it a lot, but that is really the core to making dynamic things. That is something that people who make dynamic looking shapes, Jamie Jones, other, other great, you know, um, loose painters, they look at the thing and they understand the essence of it, then they make a mark. So you have to stop, figure out what it is, and then you can start making marks. Because every single mark I made was based on, right now that I'm making, was based on an initial understanding that this is a city, it's on a grid, and these buildings are all going in a perspective. So I figured, well, if they're already going in perspective, why don't I draw them with a the perspective-making making tool to begin with? And I'm not looking at them and being like, oh, well, how do I draw that exact building? What does that exact building look like? I'm just kind of erasing out. And again, oh, this is an important thing. If you look on the right, you'll notice I'm erasing out in the layer mask because there's no way to erase with the line tool, right? There's no erase with the line tool. So the only way to erase with the line tool is put a layer mask on a layer that is already colored in and then draw in black with the line tool on the layer mask because as we know, in a layer mask, black erases, white draws in. So that's a clever, I think, helpful way to... Um, erase with the line tool in the case of this where you notice all my erase marks are telling the perspective like instead of me drawing out the perspective I'm letting my line marks of my erasing be the perspective of those buildings um, and that's kind of I mean I'm combining two steps into one instead of drawing it all out but you could imagine doing that when you start drawing it's like as you go you just kind of erase out the perspective lines in perspective so that means when you lay that mark down you got to make sure it's pretty much kind of exactly where you want it. Again, you're looking at everything twice and then just slashing it perfectly once. You're not just slopping stuff around um, all over the place. Um, now I'm starting to go in there and just, the reason I zoomed out is because I wanted to just see the lights. Um, and I want to get a feel for where the lights are. I wanted to squint at it. I didn't want to start getting in there and getting carried away. I wanted to kind of squint and just get a sense of where are the lights in this picture. And in, and in a general way, without going in there and be like, there's a light here, there's a light here, there's a light here. Because any place I don't sense that there's lights, I shouldn't add them. See, that right area, that left area there has a, has a bunch more lights. Um, what's going on now, Shaddy's Fatty? What are you doing? Getting in there, racing a little more. At some point, okay, now I went back and looked at the painting um, just as a comparison, just to see how far we come or what we've done so far. Um, see, there you go. So now I'm like cutting out of that shape a little bit. And you'll notice, look at the freeway up there in the photo and then look at what I'm doing. Just breaking out that shape in a layer mask and adding these round shapes, I'm starting to indicate all those trees that are in the environment. Because this, this, this city, and like all cities, has tons and tons of trees. Humans, we're a huge fan of trees because they give us air, right? Well, at least they, uh, they help give us air, so we happen to love them. So we grow them all over the place in cities. You're always surprised. The only places that don't have trees, and that's my, always my problem with the dystopian, futuristic cities. It's like, really? Did we decide we hated trees all of a sudden? Why would we do that? It's the future. We built hover ships and floating cities. Why on earth would we not have brought some plant life with us? And hovering pots or something, you know what I mean? I, and also, I just get bummed out. I, I like to have, I like trees around. And every time I see a futuristic city without trees, I'm like, there's no freaking way that a person decided they suddenly do not want. That's all of our society decided. You know what? We're good. No more trees. Fuck trees. There's no way. We love trees. So uh, yeah. So there, I added some of the green. It's a subtle green. It took me a while to kind of figure out that green too, because it's a weird dark kind of subtle nuanced green that is very blue. It's on the blue side. I don't see color. Yeah, it's just color picking it. Let's see what's going on. Now I'm adding the shadow sides of those trees. And you'll notice the trees are on a layer, the light side, and the shadow side I'm painting on a layer underneath that layer just to get those little shadow bits that are all the uh, the, the, the cr cracks and crevices. Um, Adding a little more, using McNulty now to kind of erase out the tops of those buildings to get a feeling of just distressing those edges a little bit. Um, and then a big Cal Drogo from far away, um, just because it throws a texture on everything, a loose sort of um, textury texture that is nice because, again, I'm going to have an issue with unifying stuff. 
Um, right now I'm taking good old leaf brush and probably spreading it out a little bit, going to the layer layer settings and just moving moving those around so that I can just do a little smattering of lights in certain places. And you notice how far away I'm working? That's on purpose. That's so that I don't get caught up. And look how many marks I'm making in erasing. Because the goal is not to get in there and detail it. It's to throw those bad boys in and as quickly and as few strokes as possible. And do I care that they're not McNulty? Do I care that I'm using a different brush that isn't painterly? No. I don't worry about um, the, the unity of everything at first. I just use whatever brush I think is the right one for the job, for that specific job. And then at the end, I will worry about how those things kind of will all go together. And you'd be surprised. If you paint in a dynamic way, Photoshop ends up having its own style. There's a thing called Photoshop style. And I think it looks good when it's done well. It looks fresh. So I, I look at how far out I spaced the, the, the dots, even just thinking about the texture of the dots. Notice I use some Cal Drogo, and it looks like there's a lot of little dots back there. Um, tons and tons of lights. And that was on purpose. Like how I pick, well, the reason I picked Cal Drogo is because I knew that he would do a nice job. Um, there's the original painting. There's the one on top of it. And you can see how much more precise, but not necessarily tight, that it looks. Because in all the areas that demand preciseness, um, I tried to be very exact. Um, now I'm adding those last loving little bits. And now, see, the thing is, I'm done. I did it all with the line tool. If I need some more looseness, I'm going with McNulty. Whatever. Now I can. Now at the end, I can afford to do a little overpainting. And a little bit of overpainting with McNulty goes a huge way. Like you don't, you know, you could, you drew it all with the line tool. You you hardly even see that there was any line tool now. All you see is that there was some really perspective-y buildings that work that are in proper perspective. Um, they're not even in proper perspective. They're kind of off, but whatever. Um, but yeah, now a little bit of McNulty overpaint, and that's why I'm saying draw it all tight in the way that is most um, you think will work the best in Photoshop. Then go in after and just do a little bit of a. McNulty overpaint. McNulty's unruly, but he gets the job done, as you know from the uh, from the sheet. So he's great for going in there. And as much as you think you would need to make the things match, here's another misconception: is that you're just going to express a painting, and all the areas are going to look painterly and beautiful. But you got to really force the unity in a painting. Meaning, if an area looks a little bit too uh, not as tight as another area, or the focal point doesn't have as much detail as another area, you really got to force that to happen by just going in there and manually tweaking all the knobs a tiny bit. That is how you make it good. It's not going to just be good because you expressed it well the first time. It's gonna, you're going to express it kind of okay and shitty, and then you got to go in and just add layers. Um, you know, add tweaking to things so that all kind of make sure it looks unified. And how do you decide if it looks unified? You look at it and you're like, does it look unified to me? Um, I added uh, um, a little bit of Cal Drogo, and now I'm going in with some Ned Stark. And notice on top, Sample All Layers is turned on because I'm on a new layer, and I'm using Mixer Brush Tool. Look on the left and notice that I'm not using a regular brush. I'm using Mixer Brush Tool. If you click on Brush and scroll down, it goes down to Mixer Brush Tool. And Ned Stark is in the brush set, um, downloadable on my site, and you'll see with him uh, every edge that I kind of want to just, that is a little bit too crisp, that isn't the focal point, and even near the focal point, because I kind of, that front right area, I kind of decided was the front focal point, because it kind of is in the picture, and then the second thing you look at is the mountains. Um, it's a pretty straightforward, simple composition. Um, let's see what I'm doing here. Yeah, there you go. There's a comparison of the two. Um, yeah, so here you can have a look. Um, the photo on the left, um, before what we had, and then... Uh, the changes I made. Um, the point being, you don't want your strokes to be slower. You don't need to not have looseness. The problem is your looseness has to be really careful, really tightly constrained. The only the only part that's loose is the exact moment you make a mark. But everything up until that is not loose. Your thinking is tight. Your analysis is tight. Everything is tight. It's just that mark making is loose. And here I want to show you guys one more thing. Um, this is Jacob's next attempt. So he sent me his first image to critique. I did a video tutorial for him. And then he sent me his next image. And I almost had nothing to say. Based on the photo, this is 100 times improved. I mean, it's amazing. He just was more careful with his strokes. He made everything really methodically. And if you look at the photo and look at his painting, the only areas where I told him that I thought uh, a little bit of improvement 
is necessary are because of what the photo is lacking in the foreground and in the water. Both of those are blurry and mushy in the photo. It would be nice because those are so close to the camera to get more detail. But otherwise, amazing job. So I get a lot of um, you know work from a lot of people that want feedback and critique. And the problem is I'm, of course, extremely busy, as everyone is, as I'm sure you all are. Um, but if you want a private video critique, let me know. But here's the catch. They're not free. Gotta get those dollar bills. So if it's something you're interested in and you think it would be valuable and you have some work that you think is ready, let me know. We can talk about rates and I would love to help you. That way you get a private one-on-one -on -one tutorial that I think is something that you can have, that you can reference, and that will hopefully um, be really useful to you. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Talk soon.